This week, in front of a live studio audience, we're rolling out the tartan carpet for Independence Royalty. Welcome to the Yes in the City show. I'm Naz. I'm Cami. And today we are joined by award-winning broadcaster, journalist, author and seasoned podcaster, someone who leads from the front in the Yes movement, the one and only Leslie Riddick. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. I'm just a bit overwhelmed by the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, coming in. <laughs> you certainly deserve it, but thank you very much for, for coming in today. I'd like to go back to your Oxford days oh God. and ask, did you ever have any bust-ups with the Bulletin boys? Um, I avoided all of that stuff completely. Um, I mean, I nearly left. I, I was at a school that was very chuffed to get somebody that could get to Oxford. So I was under heavy pressure to go once I got accepted. Mm -hmm. And actually, I didn't get the exams I needed to get in, but they let me in because of my educationally disadvantaged background, mm -hmm. viz Scotland, which was in itself a bit of a right. So I was there for a year. I, I was so socially wrong. Um, just didn't fit in with anything pretty much mm -hmm. that I was I, I really could hardly handle it so I had an, an application in to transfer back to Scotland and then I got involved in politics and mostly uh, there was anti-apartheid uh, gosh I set up a feminist magazine there's all sorts of stuff on the go at the time and that sort of took me into a posse of people I could kind of handle mm -hmm. these 20 people <laughs> um, you, you kind of knew they were there but it's really weird if there were certain colleges that were very much more sort of left wing I was in one of them and you just didn't come into contact with them mm -hmm. unless you went to the traditional things but you couldn't escape stuff like uh, you know having din having your dinner in hall and then I mean the thing that I just couldn't tolerate was there's big long kind of wooden t uh, mm. tables and t benches and stuff and if you if you wanted more water people would just take the water jug and kind of like not breaking conversation just wave it around like this for some person who was about 20 or 30 years older than you the local because these people were called scouts mm -hmm. and these these guys were very often treated like absolute dirt what got me was there was not even a moment of turning to say could I have some water? Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. It was just this, yeah. you know. Privilege. Yeah. Totally. And actually, I opted out then of anything to do with going into hall and just basically ate wadges of bread and cheese in the room on my own. <laughs> it's quite possible to just have a different life. And that's what I did. I was very involved with the student union. Mm -hmm. Like Nobody on the right was involved with the student union particularly. Although, to be fair, it had been run by conservatives until I won. I was the first non-conservative and first woman wow. uh, president of the student union. They didn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, all their dads were lawyers. So I got stymied on every decision I took. Uh, I got lawyers letters, interdicts, interjun you know, injunctions. And basically I went grey at the age of 19. Wow. It was so stressful. And that was the end of organised politics for me. Wow. I came out of there just thinking, that we're all children, we're all behaving like children. This seriously doesn't matter. The work that you do in the movement and stuff, I think a lot of people think of, why didn't you go into politics? That's why. Just because of the, the establishment? No, because I just saw very up close all sorts of stuff. You know, I mean, people say this, you should never see laws or sausages being made, but laws are made by political parties, so they're part of the sausage machine. Yeah. And I, I probably would concede somebody has to do it, but it's not going to be me. And uh, there was too many things I saw really very close up, but mm -hmm. particularly around the hunger strikers in Northern Ireland who were dying at the time. Um, Labour had just taken over running the National Union of Students. They didn't want a policy like campaigning for the hunger strikers on the books mm -hmm. because they had just got Thatcher at that point. Um, so they basically gerrymandered a, yeah. a discussion to make it look as if we were all IRA supporters. I, I was in the front page of the Daily Telegraph um, as an IRA member. So then I, I kind of set up a direct action group with a number of um, much, much better followers, <laughs> although probably equally pointless, which given that Oxford was kind of the centre of a lot of big companies coming for their milk round interviews, uh, we tried to occupy everything that was on the list of unsigned companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had the list. And actually, after we made it, the rule was you don't debate it, you, you just occupy it. 
So we had Anglo-American, Rio Tinto Zinc, uh, Barclays, you know, most of the apartheid. Um, and when they came anywhere near us for interviews, we practiced non-violent direct action techniques every Wednesday, which are interesting to do because they're non-confrontational, strangely. Um, and they're trying to make someone, they're trying not to make you wrong, mm -hmm. just stating very assertively what you intend to do. And we all trained at that for, for years, the years that we did it. And some of those people are quite prominent in other bits of the, of, of the media now, and we have all stayed in touch. I mean, it's interesting that you said that some of these people have went into the media. Would you say that that sort of distaste for you know, politics was the sort of the, the catalyst for you moving into media because I, I hear a lot that people in the media say that it's about holding politicians to account and I guess fundamentally it is whether or not it still does so is another question but would you say that that was probably the core driver of your transition into pursuing a career in journalism? Uh, probably a lot but I mean the other thing was my, my mother's family come from Caithness my mum and my grandfather were great storytellers I mean, they loved talking to people. They, they would park themselves anywhere and you'd have to come and just winkle them out. Come on, you're leaving now. Boop, 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 boop. And so I just, I just do love that. I mean, everything is about the stories that people, you were talking about this yeah. earlier, about what you're seeking to do. Thank God somebody's got that stories are all that matter. They're all that matter. The statistics, all the rest of it gets bolted on once you've interested someone in a story. So that moment of epiphany hit me in the middle of a lot of very ranty people back in 1978-79 who were in you know very sloganizing and I kind of thought there's stories behind this that nobody's pulling out and that's what people relate to then yeah. they might listen to your slogan so that was to be honest it was more that and I spent a, a summer volunteering at Radio Oxford um, and that stood me in pretty good stead because it was radio, it was talking was the thing. And that after I got that into my head, I was off. You mentioned there about people's stories and um, how you went into your, your journalism. So what's your story? Why everybody's got their own reasons for, for independence. We've all got really, really good reasons for it. What's your own personal story? Why do you want Scotland as an independent country? Um, well, uh, because I've seen over the top to what we could be over and over and over and over again. Um, probably, I mean, this, going back in time, there would, might have been other reasons. But since I became very interested in the Nordic countries, mm. I see Scotland everywhere I go. I see us yeah. as we could be. I see connections. I see people ready to help us. I see all the possibilities that we've got. And that's what it is. It feels a bit like, you know, being a wee bit tall, it feels a bit like just being able to see over a fence that's yeah. just too tall for most people to see over. But I see over it all the time. So that's what drives me bonkers, basically, because, you know, to me, there is no argument about this. Also coming from Ireland, I mean, yeah. I grew up in Belfast. Um, it's one of the things I get into in the book here is how things have changed since 2014. In 2014, no one mentioned Ireland. It was, you know, bad news. It was a bloody struggle for independence and nobody wanted to bring it up as a reference point. And they'd gone belly up. I mean, Alex Salmond mentioned it in his arc of prosperity and it promptly keeled over and nearly became bankrupt with Iceland in 2008. So Ireland was not anybody's poster child, mm -hmm. but by gum, have things ever changed yeah. now? Yeah, very you recently. Yeah. So it's yeah. not just Brexit, it's, yeah. it's the fact that Ireland has <clears throat> managed to resolve problems that anybody who was, a, who was a watcher, and certainly anyone who lived there, never thought would be re resolved, like gay marriage, like abortion, yeah. by a citizens' assemblies. And to me, that's probably, that's so important because it made Ireland look like a more secular, more reasonable, more progressive, more go-ahead country to folk in Northern Ireland, yeah. who always thought it was full of donkeys. Yeah, and that's why you're, where you're seeing that change now, aren't you, in Northern Ireland as well. So you mentioned there that, was it the Daily Telegraph, did you say, that they put you on the front page? Uh, amongst others, but that's the one that, that hurts. That <clears throat> one. It was just going on to, um, you've been on things like Question Time, um, quite regularly and the, the Sunday show. I feel as though, be it the BBC or any of the media outlets, it feels as though they set the field of play 
um, for us independent spoke at a disadvantage. Um, we've even heard stuff like they, um, they, they back check audience members, they go on their Facebook and stuff like that. Um, so when you consider that the mainstream media is totally against the independence movement, how amazing is it that we're thriving at the moment? Uh, it is. Um, just to make clear, I've worked for the BBC for 25 years, so I'm, I'm aware of the way that they... So, for example, um, we, we would all... I mean, I was working there before there was social media, but if there had been, we'd have checked people's social media for one reason, because we were honour-bound, if we were having a hustings event, mm -hmm. to produce balance within the audience. So what we had to do was, was to actually... You know, let's say I remember actually doing a hustings with Nicola Sturgeon in it in two thousand and three, two thousand and four, and on all the other contestants for the leadership, and so we had to give batches of tickets to each of the so that in the room we didn't just have everybody who was a Nicola Sturgeon supporter yeah. or a Mike Russell supporter. So, in a way, actually, you do kind of almost need to know where people are coming from to be able to make sure you've got them e evenly panned out. The problem with Question Time, which is the program you're really looking at yeah. on that, is... Um, Fiona Bruce. Or, well, because she's, she's been accused of being a little bit biased. Yeah. She, like she cuts them off a lot. just go through this, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, their difficulty <clears throat> is that they want to travel places and not reflect the real tilt of that audience. Um, so this is the problem the BBC is, is having an, a notion of balance, which is about as sophisticated as something a two-year-old would come up with. Um, so if you go to Dundee yesterday, you've got to have balance. It's got to be a balance that looks right to Surrey. So in Surrey, they voted Brexit. Mm -hmm. Oops, Dundee voted Remain, and it's full of independent supporters. So then you end up bussing people in from somewhere else to try to make it look like the Surrey balance in Scotland. And it's just, why do that? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, this, this is... It's a sort of denial of place that is a huge part of how the BBC has become. But you're too young, she said, pulling the oldie card, <laughs> to remember, <laughs> but perhaps some of the audience do, a programme called Nationwide. Do you remember Nationwide? I don't yeah. remember Nationwide. Right. <laughs> and that's the point. <laughs> Interestingly, no, no. it was on at the same time that Ted Heath was actually a big supporter of devolution, a Tory Prime Minister who, was, who created the Declaration of Perth, it was a big. It was the first big advance in ideas about devolution. You know, this is. I know it's all ancient history now, but at that point, the BBC had uh, its network biggest program mm -hmm. nationwide, which had a contribution from all the different uh, programs around the the UK. And it, I mean, you got to hear everybody's accents, different stories, and all the rest of it. That was quite a devolved outlook about what the UK was like. It stopped the second Margaret Thatcher became leader. Right. So, you know, that was a massive change, and the BBC just ended up mirroring the change actually in what became the leadership, the leading party. And indeed, you know, Labour did go through the devolution, but it looks like it's simpering along as well. Yeah. So, look, the thing is, I'm not denying that they've got loads of inbuilt prejudices. Yeah. Um, they think independence is a phase and we'll get over it. Yeah. They, you know, they, they think this, well, they're there to. Who makes news? That's the big question. The people that make news are the great and the good. You don't get to make news. 100,000 people on the street doesn't get to make news. 100 people protesting about ferries, that gets to make news. So there's all sorts of problems there about how they decide what makes news. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, obviously, being a seasoned um, podcaster like yourself, I think that's one of the main difficulties that we've got in our movement is that uh, you know, we all feel that the media is, is against the movement. Um, certainly, big big parts of it are. So things like podcasts and, and social media can be a negative. It, it, a, a lot of I mean, sometimes the freedom um, where we get into a lot of arguments and and, and, and kicking off with um, unionists and, and stuff like that. Maybe it doesn't. You know, it's not as productive as it could be. But we feel as though that we hope so that podcasts and, and things like that does give people a platform to go. Because sometimes you know. Yeah, but we feel as though we don't get our message across. Yeah, of course, of course, right. But the thing is, until you know, the the very reason that we're trying to change Scotland is that it is a stifled, muffled yeah. uh, society where it's unbelievable that fifty percent of people want radical change and find themselves kind of on the wrong side of the lines in just about every capacity. You know, so 
it's an odd one, but um, where do you put your energy? I always say this to people because people love to get annoyed about the BBC. Right, and fair enough, knock yourselves out. Mm -hmm. I didn't, right? I went off and made some films, didn't even offer them to the BBC because I've got blood pressure issues. No, I haven't actually, but I would do, right? So it's just like, why bother? They're going to knock it back. They're going to yeah. want changes. You know, just no. So people, when, when I've shown those films anywhere, and they've now clocked up more than three quarters of a million views online, and only a small proportion is me, right? Um, there's nothing that, that if, I, if that had been put on the BBC, they wouldn't be the same films because they would have been executive produced mm -hmm. away from you know, anything too contentious. They would have been put on at 11 o'clock at night and 3,000 people would have watched it. Yeah. And they would control the rights and you wouldn't have seen it. Yeah. So the thing is, what do you want to get annoyed about, right? I mean, I could get annoyed about a whole load of stuff in life. I'm not doing it. That's an attachment issue, not to get too Buddhist on you. But we've got to hold our energy. Decide what you want to do with it. When there's things that you can't do much about, I won't direct any energy towards it. Mm. So I'm just doing, hopefully doing a film about Denmark this summer, and it will go straight online, and hopefully it'll take us over a million. So, Amazing. you know. Amazing, no. And it's exactly those sort of films that inspire a lot more hope as mm -hmm. well. We, we talk about social media, and you know, we shouldn't get annoyed about the fact that we're all, well, we seem to be getting annoyed at one another, but it's more, I feel, that we need to be doing more to be creative and be, yeah. be yeah. able to show people above the fence, as you mentioned earlier, show people what you know we can do and show the potential that we have here, which may or may not be a good segue into talking about uh, your new book. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do you want to give us a sense of what that's about? Um, <coughs> <laughs> it's funny, actually, it's here, right? But, um, <laughs> it's, quite there. it's strange when, you, you've, when you've produced something like this, it's hard to sort of get your brain around what the whole thing is, again. Mm. But fundamentally, <clears throat> It's really looking, in a way, it's looking at how the case for independence has changed 10 years on, because it is pretty much 10 years since yeah. we started the campaign. And it strikes me that, well, I originally was going to call it um, the, the nation, the kingdom, and the cool, cool neighbours, but the publisher said that. Was <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but that, to me, that holds it, because each of those three groupings have changed a lot. The nation of Scotland has become, um, I mean, John Smith talked about the settled will of Scotland, but only with reference to wanting devolution. You don't get a settled will that doesn't just keep growing. The settled will is to be a social democracy. It's to be fair. It's to be progressive. This is what we vote for. We've been at it for 90, since 1955, pretty much, voting for that. And that's, that settled will, you know, to be a progressive nation, doesn't fit into a conservative state. And basically, Britain is a conservative state. Now, if anybody doubts that, I don't suspect too many people in this <laughs> audience will, but, you know, there'll be people who think, yeah, but, you know, Keir Stormer might... Okay. But look look back at where we've got to. It's taken decades for us to get, like boiled frogs, mm. to get where we are now, um, where we are just the most, you know, Britain is the most regressive country in practically every respect. People worrying about a pension when the British pension is the worst in the developed world. Yeah. This is where we've got to. Now, that's not easy to change because, for example, the Labour Party will not even talk about Thatcher's privatisations. There are privatisations there, like water, for example, which are, in the whole world, utterly weird. There is almost no one who privatised their water. The Americans have got publicly owned water. Nobody in their right minds would give something as important as water to the private sector. And, and, and we did that. Thankfully, Scotland really organised and managed to keep ours in the, in the public domain. But England is now sitting with 19 private uh, water and waste water, you know, sewage yeah. companies, yeah. which is very strongly allied to predictions that the south of England will run out of water in 30 years. Now, one of the last known things that Boris Johnson came out with as mayor was that he wanted to create a conduit from the south of Scotland to take our water down to solve that problem. I kid you not. It's in here. There are three or four other experts who have gone into that, figured out that it's cheaper than, uh, than HS you know, 1 or 2, whichever the rail that didn't end up happening, 
and that it would be utterly essential to keep the south of England afloat. Wow. So, you know, there's, there's quite extraordinary differences that are just not going to be overcome quickly. The other thing uh, that's happened, I think, is that we become much more aware of our neighbours. Now, unless we are a different species of human than occupy all the little countries around us, it is not possible that we have the basket of advantages that we do, especially in the energy field, and have not got the prospects that all the countries around us have. Yeah. So I've spent some time, and probably more than I intended to do, looking at the blocks that I think people have that stop them being able to take that in. Because I think a lot of times, you know, people, you'll throw facts and figures at people, and basically you're talking to the hand. Because somewhere in there, they've got a couple of, you know, they've got a couple of positions that you're not going to get around very easily. One of it is, Scotland is a barren wasteland, remote and stuck in the middle of nowhere and pretty useless. And actually, when you look at the fact that a fifth of Scotland is run as a driven grouse moor, we should just be hand, hand, you know, grateful that the toffs take it off our hands. It's crap. And this is utter nonsense, you know, the, the, and it's a constructed nonsense. Now, I just I look for centuries how that construct was created of Scotland's barrenness. But it's a very important one to start to undo because otherwise you think you're living in a pup. Mm -hmm. And the prospect of being alone in the world with the pup is terrifying. The next one is that we're crap, basically, that Scots themselves lack capacity. Now, this is a big one to unravel, partly because uh, I don't think we have had enough control in small ways to know what our capacity is. And this goes along with, you know, something in the earlier book, Blossom. We have the largest so-called local authorities in the developed world. We have too few people with any experience of owning or managing anything. We have, you know, the, the, the least number of people who own land. This all sounds very remote, but when you come to, to put that all together, you have people who are tentative because they haven't had the experience of running things archaically through their families for generations. And that adds up to a sort of not too sureness about just moving forward yeah. because you haven't taken decisions on small things. Mm -hmm. And you haven't, crucially, really crucially, you haven't made mistakes. I think the Scots live in utter terror of making mistakes. So that all the discussion about currency and all those yeah. things is a proxy for the terror of making a mistake and being judged badly. Do you know, you will make mistakes in life. They all the all the learning now is that the the biggest way you learn anything in life yeah. is not information; it's making a mistake. mistake yeah, learning from your mistakes. That's that's really interesting what you said because I know the in 2014 at the referendum, um, a lot of people say, in hindsight now, there wasn't enough information about um, things like pensions and currency and, and and stuff like that. And I know like there's been a lot of um, like the think tanks have done a lot of work. Um, um, putting that information out there about currency and centralising the banks and stuff like that. So, yeah, to totally agree with that. I think it is part of the brainwashing that they put out there. That yeah, but not I'm capable. not saying that, see. I'm saying something You're not different. saying that, sorry. Um, I'm saying that you can put all the pension stuff that you like out there. You can put more information. People will always say they want more information, and then they probably aren't reading it. Right. If you've got a deep-seated belief that the Scots are just crap, mm -hmm. that somehow things that will work anywhere else will not work here, then you, you, you're not going to accept the possibilities that rational argument will okay, deliver. So, right, okay, and so that's why I, I've spent some time trying to go through why, I mean, if you just even look in literature, this may be peeling off in a too weird a direction, but I mean, there's a thing that, um, that, that's called this, the, the Caledonian Antisogy, which was related to Hugh McDermott, but was actually invented before him. But, it basically suggests that the Scots have a duality, a head-heart duality that can't be easily resolved. Um, it, it's kind of where Jekyll and Hyde came from, this idea that there's these two constant warring factions inside a Scot. And bizarrely, we're unique in this capacity. There's nobody else on earth that seems to have this amount of an inability to kind of hold the two sides together. And it strikes me that this is very strongly because 
we are living in a country where we've had to face two directions at one time. Mm -hmm. You look at any civic hall, it's got a saltar and a Union Jack. You know, we have had to be British in public and Scottish or Gaelic in private. And that creates, sure that creates quite a lot of tension, but out of it has become a sort of idea or a trope or whatever you want to say, that the Scots are hesitant and that they make bad decisions, that they're not natural leaders, that they're pretty good followers, that they're torn. You know, all this baloney, baloney. and this yeah. has to get, you, you know, you have to call it out because I think these, I've called this a sort of a deep dive into some of these issues. If you don't start to, I think, get some of these issues worked out a bit, you'll keep pummeling people with information that's just going Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, so it's, it's about, the information's out there, but sometimes we need to reach into people's um, mentality a little bit more. Whatever issues we've got, once we're independent, we can sit down as a country and we can plan how we want our country to be. It's true, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, <laughs> but just a lifetime's experience of people who are perfectly capable leads me to think that the Scots particularly have a terror of making mistakes. So that if you, if you were to say, for example, um, one of the films I made was about Estonia, and they became independent in 1991, so relatively recently. And quite often when I've shown the film, people, the first question people will ask is what currency did they use? And I'll say, well, do you know, actually, they, I'm trying to remember now, because they changed their currency eventually three times. Mm -hmm. um, and if you talk to the people who are instrumental in going for independence, none of them can remember. Now, that's partly because once something works, nobody remembers all the, the agony before it. But also because when it became apparent they were having a problem with something, I think they tied themselves to the German Deutschmark for a while, mm -hmm. and that created problems, and they changed. Yeah. Now, these people changed and were fairly confident about changing without it being, Oh my God! <laughs> you know, we didn't get it right first time, we yeah. haven't got all the answers now. I mean, the, the level of, of certainty that's being asked for from, from for the independence case is not being applied to the case for being in the Union in five years' time or two minutes' time. There's, there's a requirement on the independence side to produce utter certainty. Yeah. And yeah. I'm afraid if you fall yeah. into the trap yeah. of, of that, you'll fail. Yeah. Because actually nobody can be certain and give yeah. utter guarantees. Now I know it just reassures everyone to say it will 100% be like this, but this is feeding the need all the time. It's actually being quite honest, isn't it, actually? I think that's actually being quite... I think you're right, actually, because what we do when we're out on the doorsteps and stuff like that and, and try to convince people, we are trying to answer the questions as in categorically, this is how we'll do pensions, this is how we'll do that. But I think what you're saying is we have to be real about it. This is going to be our approach. We might get it wrong, but we will work it out in the end. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is obviously, you've got to have a starting case, yeah. and it would be better for a lot of these things to be quite more worked out. But, um, of course, if stuff changes, because everything's constantly changing. Yeah. So the idea that you could, you know, now know in four or five years' time exactly wh where the euro will be, probably yeah. still pretty good, but, you know, might be an option to join at some point. I don't know. You know, there might be, it might be worth having a referendum on at some point. Yeah. But, but like, the, the idea that you have to, because of course you get unionist pushback, mm -hmm. they don't know. Look, one of them says one thing, one of them says another thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, some of this is just a, a lot, and it's not an easy thing to get over, yeah. but with, with frightened people, yeah. they're craving certainty. Yeah. And that, I'm mean, looking at that bunch who will not move to independence, yeah. no matter how rational it looks, no matter how crap Westminster is, and you'll probably get almost everyone to to say now, Westminster is a busted flush. It's yeah. just full of absolute charlatans, and you know they don't expect much more from Keir Starmer except less pain. Yeah. Um, well, what's wrong with this proposition over here? And the thing that's wrong with it is it's us. The thing that's the strength of it is, for anyone who's a yeser, is that it's us running it's us. it. But the thing for anyone who's got the cringe, or has got the disempowerment, mm -hmm. or has got the fear, the fear. Yeah. right? Yeah. Is that's what the fear is? Yeah. It's us yeah. and the unspoken fear of failure, is, and we're shite. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we can, there's one chapter in the book called um, 
oh gosh, I forgot what it was. Um, it's the it's the hope that kills you. The hope right. that kills you. Which is you know, which is what everybody says, nodding you know sagely about the Scottish football team, <laughs> you know, because basically we do extremely well against decent countries and then lose to Costa Rica. Yeah. I look again to my older course. Um, <laughs> I can remember that. Yes, right. So, um, so there's a sort of thought in there again that there's something sort of just in the Scottish performance that will fail. When I was, when I was in Iceland, um, and unfortunately we didn't get this into the Iceland film because the people we needed to interview weren't there when we went, but Iceland um, had a worse problem with its young people in the 1990s than anywhere else. And actually, I was already going to Iceland at that point, and I was kind of like, this is rougher than Glasgow. You know, this is, this is frisky, this place. Um, and actually, what they did, they looked at research that suggested that basically kids need to have engagement as soon as possible, strong engagement with sporting clubs particularly, um, really well organised, a huge variety of sports, also stuff that's not sports, you know, people who aren't, aren't into that. And they need to, the things that, that tend to bring the kids back from, you know, beyond is having parental involvement every day of the week, not just saved up to quality time at weekends. So they got the parents to promise that they would spend time uh, with their kids. The kids promised to curfew themselves so they weren't hanging around in the streets because hanging around the streets after midnight, all these indicators were, if you did all these things, you were lost a bit to, you know, just whatever happened. So anyway, these guys basically brought in this hyper sporting thing. Um, and to cut a long story short, their level of smoking, using drugs, everything else just dived within about five to ten years. They've kept going and being very careful about it. And those kids that came through that system 25 years ago are the Iceland football team, who in 20, which year was it, 2018, 19? They yeah. reached the quarterfinals or something of the, the World Euros, Cup. I think it was the Euros, I remember that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, were. that is a group of, that's an island, you know, <coughs> basically big volcano with 255,000 people on it that reached the quarterfinals yeah. of a world oh, yeah. championship, right? Mm -hmm. Now they didn't get there by just putting their you know, shoulder to the wheel and pushing with their heads down. They read the research, they took it seriously, they revolutionized everything in Iceland to be all about giving kids a better experience of life. Now, there's a wee lesson, I think a big one in there for us, because you can keep going on about the hope killing you and all the rest of it, or you can do something you can actually look at what works is getting power right down and energy and money into everything as grassroots as you possibly can. And that's what will turn things around. And you know, maybe we should worry less about where we are in European league tables and worry a lot more about the fact that most of our kids uh, are not even playing outside. You know, it's basically successful countries, what the Nordics have to teach Scotland and Britain generally. Britain is obsessed with elites, where the top is. Mm -hmm. The Nordics are obsessed with where the average That's is. True. The average. It's because the average will move, everybody moves up. And the, the secret to their success is no secret. It's a focus on averages. And that, to me, you know, is a big one that Scotland's got to get its head around because we think that way. And then we get very exercised about elite teams and so on. Yeah, and it, it won't happen overnight. I think I like the fact that you you've made it. Like we have to be just a little bit honest with us. I think when you look at any other independence movement or any other countries that have come out of British rule, it isn't always easy at the start. Um, you know, a lot of countries have, have found it difficult. If you look at India, for example, when the British left, they went through famines and all sorts of civil issues working out who's running the country and that kind of stuff. So they went through a lot of struggles, but, you know, they, they've got themselves up to being, you know, a world leader in, in a lot of areas. So, no, I, I actually quite respect the fact that, yeah, we can't actually have all the answers, can we? We've got no, a, we can't. Yeah. But, I mean, really, it's a sort of howl round of nervousness that happens when people say, give me certainty. You say, yeah. here's certainty. They know that's bullshit. Yeah. They doubt you. Yeah. So you give them more certainty because they look doubtful. They doubt you more. Yeah. You go on and on and on like this. It's a hard thing to do to create a different register of public debate. 
But somebody has got to sort of try and take the foot off the pedal and change the way that this yeah. debate is, is going. A lot of the time, I would suggest, you have to keep changing the, the focus, which is how well is Westminster doing? Mm -hmm. What did they do yesterday? Mm -hmm. And what's possible? Yeah, what's, what's possible is absolutely what's out the there. Potential? I spend, I, but still, I mean, I spend most of my time doing films, books, everything else about mm -hmm. what's possible. You've still got to keep reframing it back to say, here's what you're accepting. Mm -hmm. You're accepting, I mean, just the ludicrous the nonsense that pours out of that place. The trouble is people have now just gone, it's like the children. Yeah. They've just they've just started to price in that there's no point even listening to them anymore. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, you know. Yeah, we need to change. And if I can sort of come in on that, I would like to know, so a few months back I was at an event with yourself and Tommy Shepherd speaking, trying to get more young people to form an independence group. I think it was at my old university of Edinburgh and just sort of joining together the systemic barriers. What role do young people have in sort of overcoming those barriers that you've spoken about um, in terms of you know, we always sort of doubt ourselves? It feels like to me, amongst my peers, there's this sort of optimism and we don't really suffer from the same concerns that maybe the wider population of Scotland does in the sense that a lot of my friends are of the opinion, you know, independence is so much better than anything that we've got just now. It doesn't feel like those same obstacles are necessarily there. Well, I think you've answered your question there. <laughs> I mean, that's what you guys bring. It is, a, it is a, just a cheery thing to, to, to keep looking at those statistics. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, even if some of you become a bit, you know, conservative with age or a yeah. bit inactive or, you know, you get a big car and if there are big cars in the future and uh, it turns your heads a bit, there's still a majority for independence that's coming, you know, with, as time goes on. Um, and that's fabulous. I, I, I don't know. You, you would be a better place to answer where that's coming from. You know, it's, you, you probably haven't known Scotland really without a Scottish Parliament. No. And then you probably don't remember very vividly a Scottish Parliament without an SNP First Minister. No. Right. Again, yeah. That's pretty game changing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the thing is, you're norm that's your normal. And in that period, um, actually since uh, since the Scottish Parliament began, there have been 10 Labour leaders in Scotland. There have been four SNP leaders. So there's actually been a lot more constancy with each of them, which is what makes the change that's happened recently even more so. <laughs> I mean, if you're in Labour, you get pretty used to seeing a new face coming along every yeah. couple of years. Um, so. That's, I think that's a lot of it, is that's become fairly normalised for you. There's a Scottish Parliament, so what's the problem? Why wouldn't you want yeah. more? But still, um, it's a tr you know, I would love to know more from you, actually, <laughs> about how that, that sort of optimism... Is yeah. it a thing of optimism I'm, or...? I'm, yeah, I mean, I've spoken before on this podcast, about the, or on this show, sorry, about the fact that in 2014, I was removed from the sort of... I was at that age, do you know... Where you're like, I hate politics. Politics is stupid, and I hate it. But I remember 2014 very, very vividly because the whole there was a buzz around the school. I was too young to vote, but I do remember looking from the outside, sort of looking in, that it felt like the battle between good and bad. Like it felt like it. It, it sounds extreme, but it did. It felt like a battle between positivity and negativity. And I think a lot of you know we saw the wave of. SNP and JS members yeah. that came after 2014, I think a lot of that stems from that perception of people looking from the outside and seeing the positivity that was being spread. And I think that young people will, will keep that with them. And especially going back to what you just spoke about earlier about Britain being a conservative nation, like a, a conservative four nations, right? I think a lot of people, young people, are fed up of the fact that we never get anything that's different from Westminster. If Labour want to come into power, they shift to the right. Yeah. They shift to the right, and we get nothing new. Nothing new. This, this Labour want to be the, the old Labour, and, and, and Jeremy Corbyn's Labour are a Labour of 50, 60 years ago that, you know, that, that is, nothing is new. Mm -hmm. But with independence, we have the opportunity for something that is and that, new. I mean, it's interesting that, because uh, Neil Finlay, you were talking earlier about Labour in Scotland, and actually the left, you know, mm. the non-independent sporting left, these guys are homeless right now. In Scotland, yeah. They've got nowhere mm. to go. You know, I, I was on a do, doing an I Write event with Neil Finlay, who was a Labour MSP, 
Um, he comes from a mining community in West Lothian. And um, he's very open about his, I mean, pretty much contempt for the people who are essentially leading Scottish Labour at the moment. Mm. And he's, he's not alone. He's extremely contemptuous of Keir Starmer. I think there's quite a lot of men there actually now. Um, but, and he says in the book um, that the, the one thing that totally scared the British establishment was Jeremy Corbyn, the prospect of a Corbyn win. And I would give him that actually, that that, that actually was true. But I said to him, an independence. And he went, okay, yeah. Those two, because they're both fairly revolutionary in their ways. Um, now Corbyn, a lot of the stuff that Corbyn was suggesting was pretty much, you know, it was like, oh my God, but it was only where Scottish, the Scottish settled will has been. So mostly he was talking about public ownership. The, the statistics, even down the road, you know, the, the, the support for public ownership is pretty high. In Scotland, it's totally solid. So a lot of the time, you know, Jer they had to, I think he's probably right, Neil Finlay, that Jeremy Corbyn was painted, that well, there was an absolute hatchet job done on him by his own people to win what's perceived to be a Middle England and not trigger the active animosity of the uh, great and good and the establishment in England, partly because you see what happens in Scotland if you walk on the wrong side of the tracks, you get it, yeah. Abs you get absolutely boycotted. We talk about unity a lot um, on our on our show, like whatever guests we come on, and everybody's got the same argument that we have to unite. Like there's there's just no other way. So. Yeah, and I think this hub as well. Like we are in the yes in the city hub, but going back not to go back to the negativity of social media, but that is a negative space where we're all sort of separated, right? When you come in here. You, you get a sense of positivity. Like we come to the yes meetings every every few weeks, and there is a real sense of positivity and cohesion that comes from these just meeting one another and seeing that we are all human and that we are all fighting towards the same goal. And I would like to see a lot more of that, yeah. a lot more reaching across the divide. To yeah. Nick comes a use of phrase. And Leslie yeah. mentioned earlier about focusing your attention as well on not focusing it on the negativity. Yeah. And let's not give that oxygen. Let's try and focus on the but positives. I think the, the problem is, um, as long as you conceive of politics of, as being political parties who are working in a four to five year cycle through elections, yeah. you will end up having sides. Yeah. Because the only way people from Alba are going to get elected is by showcasing the shortcomings of the SNP. Yeah. So there's a dynamic in there that, let's not be naive, yeah. is not going to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to say, the Greens, likewise, you know, have got to only get votes by saying we're greener than the SNP, yeah. you know. But clearly, they're doing it currently in a way that doesn't make people feel quite so much so torn about it all. Because that's what political parties kind of do. Yeah. Um, this is where I think, I mean, it's a tough one, this, because the movement is underfunded, has still got people, <laughs> has not got the perhaps the confidence to get to the stage of saying, you know, we need to raise a massive amount of money to get one membership organisation going that is well, would have to be incredibly well run because it would have to be seriously uh, inclusive of all the yeah. local branches that are sprung up now from Shetland to the borders. And that's a tall ask for any organisation to really do that properly. Um, so. That would be quite a powerful thing, though, because it would then have some clout within a political process that's dominated by parties. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen because there's an awful lot of people who just can't stand one another yeah. at the top yeah. of things. I can listen to you talk all day, to be honest with you. So. Oh, well, no. But can I ask you, what do, what do, do you think that people are sort of wanting to be part of a you know, of an organised yes campaign. You know, they want they want to be a paid up member or something, or are they quite happy to be, you know, folk who are a bit lefty can be in common wheel and other folk can be in you know, they can all choose their different things to be in, if you know what I mean. I've never really thought about it, to I mean, be honest with you, apart on the sort of the paid up part. My only thing is would be is if it became paid up then would it be would it turn into a political political party at that point? That's the other Thing that I would I would think on that level, but I think people 
yeah, I mean, it's all the same group of people, isn't it, really? I mean, okay. the Alba folk were SNP folk before, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I think it is much, much the same. But I think, yeah, I think I think people would probably want to join. I mean, it's, it's, subscribe. it's, it's interesting because I've recently been, recently been thinking about the fact that there's a lot of different, there's Commonweal, uh, Business for Scotland, the Reform Scotland. There's all these different organisations painting their vision for independent Scotland. And, and sometimes these visions sort of, there's friction between these visions because people look at them and go, oh, hold on a minute, I'm not so keen on that idea. You know, we see it, even the SNP to an extent are painting their vision for an independent Scotland and there, and there are people who don't, who don't feel that that's the best idea. There's also some people who feel that they've not gone about it in the best way as well. And so it's a, it's a difficult one because in some senses it was almost necessary that these groups emerged from 2014 and began painting the picture. It was always going to happen because the fact of the matter is, is that you've got right wing, left wing, everybody in the Yes movement and that's mm. just the reality. Mm. We all agree on one fact which is we want an independent Scotland and then we'll take care of our own affairs. The fact of the matter is, is there are people in the Yes movement that I could personally say that I completely disagree with their whole ideology so yeah I think there is room for a b yeah I mean really uh, all all that strikes me some of the time is we should have a champion for independence in every street in Scotland do we no I don't probably. why not we should right there's there's the thing we should so this is nothing to do with even policy platforms this mm -hmm. is me perhaps back to back to the uh, non-violent direct action group we didn't discuss who should be on the list once we got the list done. We just decided to turn up and occupy them. So this is not about pol policy or politic, mm -hmm. you know, pl platforms. This is about organisation. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's been different groups. Now Scotland, the National Yes Network. There's yeah. been all sorts of groups who've tried to take that on. And so it's, it's, it's daunting in the sense that there's people who've gone before and for whatever reason haven't quite managed to reach liftoff. Um, but it's probably because they're trying to do it as volunteers. Yeah. So this is my point about paid. I don't think yeah. it's going to like going to be a hundred quid to join or anything. Yeah. It's something small. Yeah. But just that most other groups, if you go to other countries, um, they have a much stronger tradition of civic resistance and organisation out with political parties, whereas we don't. It's very British in a way to just go racing into a political party instead of actually forming something that's really quite well resourced uh, outside the political you know the party political arena yeah. but anyway it look it looks like that's not you know a goer there's even like the hubs if you if you imagine like obviously we've been here just over a year i think now um but even you, you hear about it, like some of the hubs close by some of them are struggling to to keep afloat if you know what i mean or get the volunteers and so yeah i think that's a it's definitely food for thought you know, is that something that maybe in the future we need to think about having some sort of organisation But the trouble being is, organised? I think the thing, the problem is for this, for the sort of dispersed yes movement is that it relies on a sense of independence being possible to get people out. Mm. I mean, it's astonishing to me. I, if, if people in other situations say, where's all the young people? I'd say, geez, when you were 16 or 17 or even 22, <laughs> Would you sit with, no offence, folks, a bunch of pensioners, right? Yeah. You know, you wouldn't. Yeah, no. You know, so it's astonishing that you do. Yeah. Um, and once there's something actual, once you get the little sort of sniff of actual power in the air, it's like an aphrodisiac, it's attractive. Mm. It's what you sniffed at school even. You could sense there was a struggle going on between uh, arguments and there was something plucky about mm. the yes side. It's something aspirational mm. and something wholehearted, uh, hopefully. Um, you can't, it's hard to recreate all of that when there isn't an actual campaign going. And the, the problem is that po you know, political parties are the ones who will decide, the SNP are the ones who will decide whether there's a campaign. So in the absence of moving forward, people move sideways. You know, this is the trouble with groups of people. They don't stay champing the ground for long. Mm -hmm. They'll start taking lumps out of one another because they're not moving forwards. Um, and that's where frustration creeps in. And that's where I would kind of like to have something else in there that was able to create a movement other than a political party. Well, I think, mm -hmm. thank you for everything today. I mean, it's been yeah. so insightful, but we'll just end how we ask, every, we ask every, every guest the same question at the end. And that is, we've already asked what's next for the independence movement, but what's next for you?
Uh, well, when I've trotted around with this book a bit, because once once you have a book, you do sort of think, oh my God, thank goodness it's out. But then, very like children, you discover there is no rest, actually. <laughs> You're basically, there's about eight or nine events on all over Scotland, which is great. I love meeting people, so that's fine. Um, after that, I've got a cycling trip on the west coast of Scotland, which means it is guaranteed to rain uh, for early July. I'm just warning you now, everybody. But then, just because you're going cycling. Yeah, totally. But the East Coast can be, can be immune. Um, and then uh, I'm making a film with, uh, the, the, with uh, Charlie Stewart that I made a film about Estonia with, about Denmark. I don't know how we're going to do it. We haven't raised any money for it. We haven't booked anything in, but we're going to do it. Um, yeah. Excellent. Amazing. And any tips for our podcast? Because obviously we've got a very successful podcast. Anything we should look out for? Any hints or tips you might be able to give us? Well, this is an astonishing thing because with all these cameras here, I didn't think this was a podcast. Oh, we, 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 I always get it wrong. I always say podcast, but we started out as a podcast. But now it's called the Yes in the City show. Yeah. So, okay, right. show yeah. Yeah. So, podcast, yeah. so it was worth me brushing my hair before I came in. It's <laughs> always a relief. Um, well, uh, you know, I think it's it's a thing about stories, actually, yeah. still. It's, it's, you think you've got it exactly right. Thank you. I mean, I, I get very buoyed up by, people will come up and just, there was a there was a guy came up to me, I'd, I'd been at something in Glasgow, I was taking the last train home, you know, the usual, um, from, from Queen Street Station, and uh, there was a guy walking up to me with very orange high-vis stuff on, a wee guy with a massive iron bar, and I thought, Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, right. <laughs> well, it's quite nice being sort of rec a bit recognisable. The hair is a bit of a giveaway um, for yesers because people come up and talk to you the whole time. But then I thought, hmm, it's quite possible that it works the other way as well. Yeah. So he was coming up to me and I thought, should I be worried? Because there was almost nobody else there. And then he came up and just said to me, honest to God, how do you handle all those unionists when you're on the TV with them? And it was. <laughs> There was a lovely quality to it because he didn't even say, excuse me, Les, he was just straight yeah, in just as if he was yeah, speaking yeah. to me all my life, you know, which is a lovely Scottish quality. Yeah. We are like an extended family yeah. where people dip in and dip out but yeah. are never gone. Um, and I kind of said to him, well, you know, it's uh, actually as soon as they start any extreme ranting, I just think, rock on, Tommy. Come to mummy. Just, just you keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I'm gonna whack you. <laughs> and, and, and you know, because they're also making themselves ridiculous. Uh, the ones you need to worry about are the fairly reasonable people. You know, that's that's the bigger yeah, worry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And he sort of listened for a while. And he was still twirling this iron bar, and uh, he said, "I," he said. I just think it would be better if somebody just put the heat in them. And I said, well, <laughs> I think you look like you've, you've kind of volunteered. And he says, ah, but it's me and my job's work. <laughs> and then walked off into the tunnel at Queen Street, this orange blob to see if you find But did this actually happen? <laughs> but, you know, there's all these things, and God knows you could actually have quiet conversation with everybody as to quite where anybody's coming from. Yeah. And you need loads of them. Loads of them. Yeah. And for thanks it. for sharing, sharing that story, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, for me, obviously, I believe in, in an independent Scotland for a lot of different and personal reasons. But for all we are, I might have a little bit of stuff going on. Yesers are all genuinely just I find just welcoming people, especially when new people are coming in and all back and certainly say. Everyone always does their best to make make people feel welcome, and and I like that part of our group. Um, we do have a bit of moaning, but there is a lot of a lot of good stuff about yeses, and I know people, um, a lot of new Scots that have come to Scotland, um, they might not understand why we want independence yet, or or you know all the kind of facts and figures that we all know about, but they join because of people, because mm -hmm. they get to know people. Like you said, the guy just come over and start chatting to you, like he's he's known you for years. I think those are the things that, because the best thing about Scotland is it's people, isn't it? And, it and those is, are the things yeah. that we need to get out there. The and that's, stories. Because that's where this is such a terrible, terrible uh, burden that so many people are carrying, is this doubt about the capacity of Scots. Yeah. Because actually it's quite the opposite. Yeah, exactly. What I keep saying to people, in fact, I think there's a section of the book that just prints a long list of all the development trusts in Scotland, and that represents groups of people who decided to take on assets, whether that is a village hall, a park, an island, uh, a bridge, you name it, that, that either the council or a private landowner has run screaming from, mm -hmm. and they've decided in their spare time 
that they're going to manage something like that for the good of the community. Exactly. There's no, everywhere else has got small councils that do things like mm -hmm. that. The amount of capacity that Scots show in resurrecting things that yeah. are kind of oh, sometimes deemed yeah. almost hopeless. It's the opposite. The capacity of people here is incredibly high. Yeah. They just haven't had the chance to sort of, you know, believe in it. Yeah, and over, overseas as well. The reputation that we've got, we're known as nice, friendly people and a beautiful country, like, but yeah, I wish we would be a bit more braver and, and you know, some people would, would, would start looking at, thinking about things like that. Because when, whenever we go on holiday, we're always welcomed by people, as soon as you say you're from Scotland. But see, this is know? another thing, um, sorry, I know you're trying to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, one, of the, one of the films is the film about the pharaohs, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a bit in it where one of the guys, uh, we ask him, what do you think about Scotland? And he, you know, he says, uh, well, he says, Scotland's got so much going for it. And watching so many audiences watching this film, it's the same every time. They lean forward, oh, what have we got going for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And he starts listening to, nobody ever lists oil and gas. So they go through various things, you know, just sort of, you know, life sciences, uh, whiskey, um, food stuff, and all that kind of stuff. And so people, and he says, but there's one incredible thing you've got. And everyone's like right in the edge of their seats. And he says, you're a friendly people. Yeah. And people go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't take that to the bank. <laughs> now, the thing is, you can. You actually can. That, but there's another of those pinpoint moments where, you know, if, if you really believe that the way that you win stuff in the world is by being a sort of mini-me version of England, of the English psyche, or let's say the you know the Westminster thing, where it's uh, survival of the fittest, might is right, you know, winner takes all, the devil take the hindmost, all that cruelty, mm -hmm. you know, that Bullington boys, whatever it's done, I never even met them, but that sort of na nasty kind yeah. of way of looking at life. That's if you awesome. internalize those mm -hmm. values as being what a winner looks like, you won't believe we're winners. Friendly is life-savingly good. Absolutely. Friendly, approachable, you know, we're funny, there's so many things. But you're not funny. Yeah, you yeah you're not yeah, funny. You're not I am funny. sometimes. <laughs> 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 but thank you very much um, for that, uh, Leslie. Absolutely amazing to have you on and taking your Sunday out to, on a beautiful day as well yeah. to come out and, and well, spend some time Since with I've that. been sacked by the Herald as a columnist, I now suddenly have Sundays. <laughs> for the first time in 18 years, I've been writing columns every Sunday for 18 years. So. Thank you, the Herald. <laughs> and thank you. That thank, was you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Scottish Parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. I will focus attention on the fact that Scotland is a misgoverned, undergoverned country. But if you succeed in this, don't you think the Scottish Nationalist Party might disappear? Oh, never. Not until we get what we want. Winifred Margaret Ewing, Scottish Nationalist 18,397.